Hi, I'm Mr. Cellini, and today we're going to take a look at the Global History Regents from August 2023. All right, so let's take a look at the first document, which is called The Epoch of Unification, published by the Japan Society Online in 2003. The samurai constituted the governing class. For the most part, they were compelled to withdraw from the countryside to the castle town, where they lived in segregated residential quarters. They retained the right to bear arms, which is like to, to hold, they had the ability to hold on to their weapons, which was something denied the other classes. The populace had been disarmed, okay, so they took away the right to bear arms from the rest of the population other than the samurai. Settling one of the principal conflicts of the, quote, country at war. So the samurai held a monopoly on inflicting violence. Here, Hideyoshi laid down the design plan for the rigid class system that matured under his successor, the successor regime, I should say, the Tokugawa shogunate, and lasted until that regime's fall in 1868. So the question here is saying, what was the main reason for implementing the system described in the passage? And I would argue that there are several systems or strategies of governing at play in this document, right? We've got the idea that we're going to relocate the samurai from the countryside to the towns, okay? Because that's something the Tokugawa shogun had wanted to do to have better control over all of Japan. They didn't want these powerful landowners uh, off in the countryside raising armies, which would challenge the main government. So they wanted to keep the daimyo, which were the rich landowners, and the samurai kind of close by to keep watch over them. So that's one system of governance that's discussed in the document. Taking away the right to bear arms from most of the Japanese population is another system. And the idea that we're going to develop a rigid social class system is also a method of governing if you're looking to maybe, I don't know, secure a stable uh, workforce, okay, because you're going to make sure that those people are kind of trapped in their positions. Um, so maybe not great for the personal freedom of the Japanese people, but it would go a long way towards making sure that Japanese society has enough of each type of person and each type of profession in the country. You all should know that the Tokugawa government wanted nothing to do with outsiders during this period of Japanese history. We can also say no to promoting cultural exchange, okay? Because like I said, they're isolating themselves. They don't want other cultural influences um, penetrating the Japanese borders. So cross off choice two. Choice three, to allow social mobility. No, we can't pick that one because they said we're going to implement a rigid social class system. Rigid means you can't move around. So if you're born to a family of, I don't know, iron workers, you're going to be an iron worker. You will always be an iron worker. Not good for your own personal freedom, but good if Japan's trying to make sure that there are people in that profession, which, you know, iron work is, is absolutely important for any society. So the best answer here through process of elimination, and because it's, you know, the right answer, is to establish power and authority, right? If you are relocating the samurai to towns to keep better watch over them, that's going to help boost your power in that country if you're the Japanese shogun. Remember, the shogun is like the supreme military commander during that time period, and they are the ones with the true power. Remember, during that time period, the emperor was kind of like more of a figurehead in Japanese culture, whereas the shogun had the real authority. So the best answer is choice four for number one. So let's check out questions two and three, which go with a document written by Toussaint Louverture, who is associated mostly with the Haitian Revolution. Citizen consul, a consul was like a Roman word that the French used for like supreme leader. The minister of the marine in the account he gave you of the political situation of this colony, which I devoted myself to making known to him, should have submitted to you my proclamation of the last 16 pluvios, I believe that's how that word is pronounced, February 5th, 1801, on the convocation of a central assembly. So we're starting a central assembly which would be able to set the destiny of St. Domingue, which is another way of saying Haiti, through wise laws modeled on the Moors, meaning values of the inhabitants. So the people of Haiti are starting an assembly, kind of like maybe a version of Congress, where they're going to make laws modeled on the ideas and values of the people of Haiti. Okay, so this is like an act of defiance, right? Because this is supposed to be a French colony, and Toussaint Louverture is saying, no, we're going to basically make our own government and try to make laws on behalf of the Haitian population. Today, I have the satisfaction of announcing to you, Napoleon, that the final touch has just been put to this work. 
I hasten to send it to you, meaning I'm sending it fast, in order to have your approval and the sanction of my government. Right? So this guy's writing this letter to Napoleon asking for sanction. That's kind of like another way of saying like approval. He wants Napoleon's approval for this new Haitian constitution and Haitian government. I don't think Napoleon's going to give that. So to me, that's kind of hilarious. Given the absence of laws and the Central Assembly having requested to have this constitution provisionally executed, which will more quickly lead to its future prosperity, I have surrendered to its wishes. So Toussaint Louverture is going to do whatever his new um, government tells him to do and whatever the new constitution says he should do. This constitution was received by all classes of citizens with transports of joy. Right? So the people, when they hear about the constitution that's being created in Haiti, they're very happy about it, right? Because a constitution typically is a kind of document that's going to give people freedoms, right? The American constitution contains the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, religion, um, right to assembly, all those kinds of things are in our Bill of Rights. So basically this document is talking about the Haitian Revolution and the idea that the Haitian people are rising up to form a new government that's going to protect their rights. And uh, the French are going to try to stop that, but they will fail. They will not be able to take Haiti back. So the question says, which historical turning point was directly influenced by the events described in this document? Basically, which one of these is an effect of the document? It's not going to be choice one. Germany unified and industrialized, that doesn't come from protests in Haiti. That's, that's, a, that's a big disconnect there, so we're not going to pick choice one. I'm going to skip choice two for now. Choice three says, Japan shifted from a period of isolation to a more modernized state. This has nothing to do with the Haitian constitution and Haitian revolution. This is, if you remember, this, this relates to the Meiji restoration, right? Once um, the Tokugawa shogunate is gone and Emperor Meiji is brought in, then Japan shifts to being a more modern society. But this document is not about, it's not about Meiji. It's about Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution. Choice four, the British Parliament began to pass legislation to address concerns over working conditions. That's like the Industrial Revolution time period. Okay, and this document is not about industrialization. It's about protests and revolution in Haiti. So this is your effect. Choice two. Europeans lost profitable colonies in the Americas and sought new imperial holdings. Okay, so going back to like the late 1700s, early 1800s, France lost control over Haiti, right? That's a, that's a profitable colony. And what did they do a little bit later in history? They went out to try to acquire new territories in places like Africa and in Asia. Okay, so your best answer choice is number two. Number two is an effect of the Haitian Revolution. Let's take a look at question number three. Which historical writing most influenced the circumstances described in this document? So basically, which one of these documents could be a cause for the Haitian Revolution? Choice one is going to be our answer here. John Locke's Two Treatises of Government, right? That's the document that described how people are born with this idea of natural rights and that if the government does not protect those natural rights, the people have a right to overthrow that government. Okay, that is something that absolutely will influence the French Revolution, American Revolution, and Latin American revolutions. Olympe de Gouges' Declaration of the Rights of Women, it's kind of related, right? Because that document talks about rights for men and women. But John Locke's, I would argue, most influenced the Haitian Revolution. Olympe de Gouges' document probably is more closely associated with influencing the women's suffrage movement rather than political revolutions around the world. Karl Marx's book, The Communist Manifesto, would influence the rise of communism and communist revolutions in places like um, Russia and in China. So we're not going to pick that one. We're not going to pick choice two. And Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is a book about capitalism and the idea of a free market and laissez-faire being the best way to run an economy. Those kinds of ideas do not influence a political revolution in Haiti. So the best bet here is the guy who says people are born with rights and should be independent from abusive governments. Those are the ideas that influence the Haitian Revolution. So pick choice one for question number three. Before we continue, if you guys could do me a favor and hit that like button and subscribe to the channel, I'd really appreciate it. It helps out a ton, and it makes sure that I can keep putting out this content for you guys to prepare for your test. Let's continue talking about the exam. Okay, so questions four and five are about this document here about the Irish potato famine. So let's take a look. That the people of Ireland, in their bitter hours of misfortune, have the strongest right to impeach, meaning condemn, the criminality of the ministers of the crown. So the people of Ireland are very upset with the English government. A minister in the English government is like um, 
I guess like their version of like Secretary of State, if you will, right? The, the people, the president's cabinet members. Inasmuch as it has pleased a merciful providence to favor Ireland in the present season with a most abundant crop of oats. So Ireland is growing a lot of crops, in this case it's oats. Yet whilst the Irish harbors are closed against the importation of foreign food, so the Irish cannot import food from other places, they are left open for the exportation of Irish grain, an, ex an exportation which has already amounted in the present season to a quantity nearly adequate to feed the entire people of Ireland. So while the potato famine is going on, the English are forcing the Irish people to export their grains to England, but the people of Ireland cannot import any grains for themselves. So that you get this weird situation in which the people of Ireland could grow a lot of food for themselves, but the grains are being shipped out, which forces the Irish people to be dependent on other products like potatoes, right? So if that potato goes bad, the Irish people are going to be in a lot of trouble. So they grew enough food to avert the now certain famine, okay, but it didn't matter because the food, the, the grains were being sent to England. Famine is like death by starvation. Thus inflicting upon the Irish people the abject, meaning wretched misery, of having their own provisions carried away to feed others, whilst they themselves are left contemptuously to starve. All right, so Irish food that could help Irish people is being sent to other places. Don't forget, too, that there were a lot of side effects associated with the Irish potato famine. For example, so many Irish immigrants came over to the Americas during this time period and settled on the east coast of the United States. It was not written to justify the export of Irish grain, right? To justify means a good re give a good reason for something. The Irish writer here does not give a good reason for the export of Irish grain, right? He's anti-export of Irish grain. He does not want that to happen. So we're going to cross off choice number one here. Choice two, we also cross off. The importation of foreign food through English ports. No, the Irish were not allowed to import foreign food. So we're going to cross that off as well. Irish protests against the British trade policies, that does sound like it could be an answer, right? Because it's the British that are telling the Irish, hey, you have to export your oats and you can't import food to support yourselves, right? That's a British policy in Ireland. Okay, Ireland was once a colony of the British. And we're not justifying the Great Famine, right? We're not giving good reason for the Great Famine. This whole document is anti-Great Famine. Okay, so the best answer here is this, is this is a document giving good reasons for protests against British trade policies. So we're going to pick choice three for question number four. Which problem is identified in this passage? They're not identifying anything about low prices for agricultural products. It's not in the document. And first of all, the Irish did not have a lot of agricultural products. It's another, another way of saying food, right? And if you don't have a lot of food, the prices are going to be high. So we're going to cross off choice four. It makes no sense. Look at choice three. The waste caused by grain overproduction. It says nothing in the source about the waste of grains. If anything, there's not enough grain to go around for the Irish people, right? So we cross that off. The opening of ports to foreign merchants. It's not mentioned in the document. Okay, the document says that Irish ports are closed to foreign merchants, right? The Irish were not allowed to import things from other countries. So the best answer here is choice two, the exporting of much needed food, right? That's the big problem that's going on here, right? The Irish have the grain, but they're forced to send it, meaning export it to other places, right? And that's contributing to the potato famine, right? Now the Irish are dependent on the potato. Once the potatoes go bad, Irish people are in trouble. So pick choice two for question number five. So question number six goes with the source called the Parliamentary Debates, written in 1893. So let's read it together. Some time ago, a party of white men, probably Europeans, came into my country, the principal one appearing to be a man named Rudd. They asked me for a place where they could dig for gold, which is a natural resource, right, that the Europeans were seeking in places that they tried to imperialize, and said they would give me certain things for the right to do so. I told them to bring it to me, and I would see what I would do. A document was read and presented to me for signature. So the European person was giving the African person, I'm assuming an African person, based on the, the seeking of gold here. Uh, so the, the European person presented the African leader with some kind of a document that the African leader was supposed to sign. I asked what it contained and was told that in it were my words and the words of those men. I put my hand to it. About three months after I heard from other sources, I had given the right to all the minerals in my country. So this person, unbeknownst to, the, to them, 
signed away the rights to the land in his country, or, or rather signed away the rights to all the minerals, meaning uh, natural resources in his country. I called a meeting of my Indunas, okay, this is like um, basically a leader in the Zulu tribe, and the Zulu were part of um, South Africa at the time. So I called a meeting of my Indunas, ad who are advisors, and of the white men, and demanded a copy of the document. It was proved to me that I had signed away the right to minerals of the whole country to Rudd and his friends. I have since had a meeting of my Indunas, and they will not recognize the paper as it contains neither my words nor the words of those who got it from me. So basically the English kind of acted kind of sketchy, right? And basically forced the Africans to sign away their resources. And the Africans are like, we're not going to acknowledge that. That's messed up. But remember, the Europeans are the ones with the superior military back then. So even if the Africans resisted, it probably wouldn't matter. Which British policy is associated with the situation described in the document? The only answer that makes sense here is imperialism, right? The idea that one country or part of the world is going to colonize another, usually to seek out some kind of economic gain. Another way to describe imperialism would be the word colonialism. Maybe have those two words in your head as synonyms. Neutrality means you're not getting involved. Certainly looks to me like Europeans are getting involved in things. Collective security is the idea, is the idea that countries kind of work together to prevent war or to stop conflict once it starts. Usually you see this concept involved uh, with things like the League of Nations or United Nations in, in our Global 10 curriculum, so cross that out. And isolationism, no, I don't see isolation here, right? I see the British going to other parts of the world, not keeping to themselves. So again, kind of goes along with choice one here. So one, two, and four are out. Best answer is imperialism, right? Europeans are in Africa to get access to gold. Boom, imperialism. Okay, questions seven and eight go with this poem that has appeared on the Regents a number of times, written by this guy named Siegfried Sassoon, and the poem is called Attack, and it's published in 1918. I'm already thinking World War I because that's an event that had a lot of attacking in 1918, right? World War I ran from 1914 to 1918, and the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919. Since we're on the subject of World War I, don't forget about your mania causes, right? militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and of course, the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austria-Hungary Empire. So I'm not gonna read this entire poem, but there are some key phrases here that help us understand that it's about World War I. Tanks creep and topple towards the wire, right? Tanks are a new war technology from World War I. Barbed wire is something that was put in front of trenches to protect the trench from uh, incoming soldiers. So that's a phrase that um, helps us understand it's World War I. Lines of gray, muttering faces masked with fear. All right, so maybe this is um, alluding to the gas masks that soldiers had to wear in the trenches. Then the soldiers, they leave their trenches going over the top. Right, over the top is the phrase that we use for when the soldiers leap over the trench to charge towards the other trench, right? Crossing over no man's land, right? You didn't, you didn't want to get caught in no man's land. You could lose your life there. And at the end here, right, oh, Jesus, make it stop. Right? The guy's saying, this, this is horrible. Right? Make this violent stop. Make this bloodshed stop. So seven should be very easy. This is definitely about World War I. Russian Revolution happened around the same time period, but there's nothing in the, the Russian Revolution about trench warfare. So we cross that off. World War II isn't until 1939. And the Korean War isn't until 1950. So the best answer is choice one, based on the year and the information in the poem. Siegfried Sassoon's primary purpose, right? Purpose is, why did the author do it? Why did this author write this poem? He's definitely not promoting nationalism, right? There's nothing in the poem suggesting, okay, people should have more pride in their countries or in their groups. So cross off choice one. Choice two is our answer, to show the horrors of the fighting and the cruelty of the war, right? Because of all the violence and bloodshed going on here, right? Making that known to people that World War I is terrible, right? So bad, please, please make it stop. Choice three is not correct. Encourage the development of more technology or more technologically advanced weapons. No, this poem is criticizing the weapons, right? The, the weapons are causing the suffering. So we don't want more of those things. Choice four, protect the environment from destruction by human actions. Well, World War I did mess up the environment, but this poem is not, does not seem to concern itself with environmental concerns, right? It's more about the, the, the horribleness of the fighting and the brutality of it. So choice two is gonna be our best answer for number eight. All right, questions nine and 10 correspond with a document called Mandates of the League of Nations. Okay, League of Nations is an international peacekeeping organization uh, established after World War I. 
okay, as part of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. And you can kind of think of a mandate as like a temporary colony. These are territories that were once controlled primarily by the Germans or the Ottoman Empire, right? The Germans and the Ottomans lost World War I. So the winners are going to divide the spoils, right? The British are going to get access to some Ottoman or German-held land, and the French and the Belgians, right? The winners of World War I are going to get those territories, right? So for example, Palestine, Transjordan, and Iraq, those are territories in the Middle East that were once controlled by the Ottomans, and now the British are going to hold on to them. And they'll say, okay, we're going to administer these territories, and when we feel that you're ready for independence, we will give it to you. Okay, so this is like kind of like temporary imperialism. But if you're a person living in one of these regions, you're kind of irritated right now because you helped the Allies win World War I. These people rose up against the Ottoman Empire, and now it's like the British are in charge. Right? Whereas maybe they think, were thinking, hey, if we help the British, maybe we can become independent. Well, they didn't get that right away. Right? So maybe they're a little bit upset about that. Uh, Syria and Lebanon, we go to the French. Part of Togoland, part of Cameroons. These were German territories in Africa that are now going to be controlled by the French. So let's take a look at the questions here. Why did Britain and France have power over the many mandates identified in this chart? It's not choice one. They had strong cultural ties to these areas. They don't have a cultural tie to the Middle East, right? We don't see a large British or French population in those regions. So they couldn't use that to justify their claims. They couldn't say, oh, we should own Palestine because British people live there. No, they couldn't say that. So we cross off number one. Look at choice three. There were large populations of British and French citizens living in those territories. Absolutely not. Going to get rid of choice three. Their experience in decolonization made them the best choices. Well, decolonization means you're giving territories back. Maybe you once owned them, now you're giving them up. This document does not show giving back territories, it shows taking territories. So cross off choice four. So what are we left with? We are left with number two. They defeated Germany, giving them a strong claim to its colonies. Okay, Britain and France beat the Ottomans and the Germans. Now the British and the French get access to their territories. So pick two for question number nine. Question 10, what was a consequence of the situation shown in this chart, right? So think of the chart as like the causes and these answer choices are possible effects, consequence, effect, kind of like the same word, right? And number one is our answer here. Nationalist movements developed in areas under European control. A nationalist movement is when the group of people in that part of the world, they say, hey, we have pride in our Palestinian culture. We want our culture to be strong. And if we're strong, we can resist the Europeans a little bit better. Okay, so these nationalist movements in places that were taken over by the Europeans, they're going to grow, and eventually they will lead to independence movements and the separation of these territories from British or French control. Palestine eventually, skipping way ahead, would become independent of British control, but it's going to be split in half, right? Half of it was supposed to go to the Arabs living there, half to the Jews. And of course, that situation got messy very quickly. And today, you know, the Palestinians don't really have their own country in that part of the world, whereas the Jews do, right? The state of Israel exists inside of Palestine. The point is, when the Europeans are in charge, people are upset, nationalist movements grow, and they push for decolonization or independence movements. So choice one is the best answer, but let's look at two, three, and four, just for the sake of discussing some of the history. Britain and France were bankrupted by the high cost of governing these mandates. You can maybe make the case that after World War II, things got that way, but not, not after World War I. So we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of choice two. More mandates were created as nations struggled to govern themselves after World War II. No, after World War II, we're not going to have more mandates. We're going to have less mandates. We're going to have decolonization. So three is like the opposite answer. So don't pick that. Germany regained power in sub-Saharan Africa. No, they didn't gain power in Africa. They lost their territories in Africa. If anywhere they gained power, it would be parts of Europe, maybe temporarily during World War II, right? Because maybe you remember how the Germans conquered France. But again, that was only for a brief moment in time. So we're going to get rid of choice four. So again, number one is our best answer for question number 10. Questions 11 and 12 correspond with some documents that focus on American involvement in Vietnam during the Cold War. Let's check out what these are about. All right, questions 11 and 12 correspond with this brief reading and with this map. So let's take a look at the documents first. In the eyes of the rest of Asia and of key areas threatened by communism in other areas as well, so we're talking about areas threatened by communism, South Vietnam is both a test 
of U.S. firmness, right, like their strength, and specifically a test of U.S. capacity to deal with, quote, wars of national liberation. Within Asia, there is evidence, for example, from Japan that U.S. disengagement, meaning the U.S. not becoming involved, and the acceptance of communist domination would have a serious effect on confidence. So this, this sentence here is kind of implying that if the U.S. does not get involved, communist domination is going to happen, right? This corresponds with something you might have learned about called the domino theory, this idea that if one country becomes communist, all the other ones in Asia are going to follow suit. That's what's being referred to here by the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, during the Kennedy presidency. So let's continue on. More broadly, there could be little doubt that any country threatened in the future by communist subversion would have reason to doubt whether we would really see the thing through. Right? So a country threatened by communism would doubt our willingness to contain the spread of communism and help those non-communist countries out. This would apply even in such theoretically remote areas as Latin America. So Robert McNamara is arguing that same thing with Latin America. If one country becomes communist, the other ones are going to follow suit, so we better do something about it before that happens. What we have here is a map of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia during the Cold War, right? And we see on this map here, with this part of the map key here, areas with the slanted lines represent communist control before 1965, right? So North Vietnam is the communist side of Vietnam. This is the non-communist South, right? And the United States got involved in this conflict to prevent South Vietnam from being taken over by the communist North Vietnamese. So let's take a look at question number 11 here. Based on these documents, Secretary McNamara believed U.S. involvement in this region would prevent the spread of communism, right? Because he says in the document up here, if we don't get involved, then all of a sudden other countries are going to become communists. So we have to be involved to avoid domination of communists over non-communists. Okay, number 12. The conflict referred to in the documents is most closely associated with, it's going to be the Cold War. Right? The Cold War is the time period where all we're doing, the United States as, and also NATO countries as a whole, is trying to contain the spread of communism, right? The Chinese Civil War happened in China. Yes, that, that does have to do with communism and non-communism, and it's during the Cold War. But this is a map about countries next door to China, not China itself. So cross off choice number one here. Cultural Revolution is another example of uh, strict communist policy in China, not in Vietnam. So you cross off choice three. Global terrorism, that's more of a modern issue, right, associated with maybe September 11th and, and going forward. So not so much communism in Vietnam. So we're going to cross off choice four. Cold War is our best answer for war number 12. All right, so let's check out the document associated with questions 13 and 14. When Kenyatta, okay, Jomo Kenyatta is a person we associate with independence in the country of Kenya, which was once controlled by the British. When Kenyatta returned on the platform for the third time, after a few other speakers, he explained the flag. So talking about the new flag of uh, Kenya. He said, black is to show that this is for black people. Red is to show that the blood of the African is the same color as the blood of the European. And green is to show that the country was green and fertile. But now you see the green is below the red and is suppressed. All right, so maybe someone else is controlling that fertile land, at least up until this point in um, Kenya's history. I tried to figure out this real meeting. What was meant by green being suppressed and below the red? Special branch agents were at the meeting recording all the speeches so Kenyatta couldn't speak his mind directly. What he said must mean that our fertile lands could only be regained by the blood of the African. That was it. The black was separated from the green by red. The African could only get to his land through blood. And that kind of means like through warfare, right? So we're going to have to fight to obtain independence from the British. Don't forget, guys, that after World War II, instead of imperialism and colonialism, we now have a period of decolonization, which takes place in Africa in like the 1950s and 60s. Kenya was one of those places that was controlled by the British. And now we see a process here in this document of decolonization in that particular part of the African continent. The author interprets Kenyatta's discussion of the Kenya African Union flag as a call for Choice one, monotheistic religion. There's nothing here about religious movements. So we cross off number one, right? If it's not in the source, if the, if the answer choice is not in the source, don't pick it. A peaceful transfer of political power to Africans. 
Why are we crossing off this one, guys, right? We're going to cross it off because this document is advocating for violence, not peaceful trans transition of power. So cross off choice two. Removal of restriction on political speech. Eh, it's not really being referred to in the document. What is referred to in the document is violent resistance against colonial authority, right? The violence is getting the land back through blood. Colonial authority is the British, right? That's the authority that was in charge of Kenya at the time. The document is saying the only way we're going to become independent is if we violently attack the British and get it for ourselves. So choice four for question 13. Question 14, which event led most directly to the situation described in this document? Meaning, which one of these four answer choices led to this? French Revolution is way, way before the document, right? And revolutions in France don't really inspire revolutions in Kenya, so we're going to get rid of that. Berlin Conference, we'll come back to that one. Treaty of Versailles, oh, that's not going to be the, the answer choice, right? Because the Treaty of Versailles led to the Great Depression in Germany, led to the rise of the Nazis. It didn't lead to violent overthrows of the British in Kenya, so cross that off. Truman Doctrine is a document or a policy of the United States to contain communism, right? This document is not about containing communism. So this Truman Doctrine did not lead to decolonization in Kenya, but this one certainly did. The Berlin Conference is something that led to this. Why? Because the Berlin Conference was that conference where the Europeans basically decided how they were going to practice imperialism in Africa, right? So the British wouldn't be in Kenya if it weren't for the Berlin Conference and imperialism. Question number 15 coincides with a classic Cold War political cartoon. Let's check it out in some detail. So let's see if we can kind of make sense of what's going on here. At the top, it says preliminary disarmament talks. Armaments are weapons. Disarmaments means getting rid of weapons. So these discussions are about trying to get rid of weapons during the Cold War, probably nuclear weapons, right? Do we see nuclear weapons? We absolutely do, right? These are missiles. I see USA on one missile. I see CCP on one missile. I know that CCP is the Soviet Union, but if you didn't know that, that's down here for you. So it looks like despite the disarmament talks, both sides still have nuclear weapons. They're also developing nerve gas over here, nerve gas over there. Okay, so multiple types of destructive weapons. Uh, we also see some symbolism here. We see like a Russian hat on this guy. Uncle Sam's top hat over here represents the United States. So which statement best describes the point of view of the cartoonist? It's not going to be choice one. Nuclear arms trees have been effective. Well, if they were effective, then you wouldn't have these weapons, right? So cross off choice one. Cross off choice two. The arms race was limited to nuclear missiles. It's not, right? Because you have nerve gas as well. It's not just nukes. Cross off choice two. Cross off choice three. The threat of armed revolution was not taken seriously. I don't know. This looks pretty serious to me, right? It's serious in terms of both sides building up weapons, which is always serious and scary. And they're, they're engaged in talks to try to limit that sort of thing, right? So that seems to me like they're taking it seriously. Maybe, you know, they're not doing enough, but they're at least acknowledging that this is a problem, okay? So choice four is our best answer here. Disarmament talks had not been effective. So they're trying, but we still have problems. We still have weapons on both sides. And that remains the case even today. Even though the Soviet Union is gone, the U.S. and Russia are the two big nuclear powers to this day. So anyway, for question number 15, the best answer is going to be choice four. Let's keep going. All right, so 16 and 17 relate to this political cartoon. Uh, so let's take a look at what's going on here. We've got a person here with a bowl. Je uh, Locke and Jefferson, please. Okay, referring to John Locke, probably the Enlightenment thinker, and Thomas Jefferson, who is also associated with the Enlightenment, but more maybe uh, from an American point of view, right? a person who helped write the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So an important person in terms of desiring rights and freedoms and independence. And we have a guy from China, or they're in China, and we have a Chinese government official here spooning out of the cauldron of ideas, giving that person some Mao, right? Probably Mao Zedong, a communist leader of China. Once the communists win the Chinese Civil War, Mao Zedong is the first communist leader of China. So even though the Chinese citizens want enlightenment ideas, they're being fed communist ideas, which are inherently uh, anti-natural rights, at least in this context. 
Since we're on the subject of John Locke and the Enlightenment, don't forget about your other Enlightenment thinkers as well. Sometimes you'll see a question about Montesquieu, right? Montesquieu has a three-syllable last name. Maybe that helps you remember that Montesquieu created the idea of separation of powers in government. You might also see a question about Voltaire. Voltaire normally is associated with the idea of freedom of speech. So choice uh, question number 16. Based on this cartoon, what is being fed to the communist people? Well. It's not democratic philosophy, because Mao Zedong is a communist leader, right? He is, he's got uh, absolute power, he's got a totalitarian regime, so that's not democratic, so cross off choice one. Choice three, capitalist doctrine. Doctrine is ideas. Mao is not a capitalist, he's a communist, so he's not, uh, they're not being fed capitalist ideas, cross off choice three. Just to go on a tangent for a second, if you look in the cauldron, you do see Deng in here. Deng Xiaoping is the Chinese official uh, who took over after Mao, who did bring in some capitalism. Okay, so maybe know that in the back of your head, but the guy in the cartoon is not giving Deng Xiaoping to the Chinese people, right? So if that's, if that's the case, we can't pick capitalist ideas. Mercantilist principles? Mercantilism is associated with imperialism. It's, not, it's, this, it's this idea basically that I'm going to create a colony and that colony should solely exist for my benefit. It should give me natural resources and the people should be forced to buy my manufactured products. This cartoon has nothing to do with that. So they're being fed communist ideology, ideas. How do I know that? Mao Zedong is the communist. Let's go to question 17. This cartoon suggests that the Chinese people and their government, it's not choice one, wanted to continue Mao's economic programs. No, if they're demanding John Locke, they don't want Mao. So we cross off choice one. Saw the need to increase agricultural imports. This cartoon has nothing to do with that whatsoever. That's, that's a very confusing answer choice. Choice four is definitely wrong, right? The Chinese people had no interest in the Enlightenment. No, obviously they had interest, they want John Locke. So our best answer is choice three. They disagreed on whether to adopt democratic reforms, right? The Chinese people want democracy. The Chinese government wants communism. So there's a disagreement there about what the Chinese people should have. Should it be democratic or should it be communists? So choice three is the best answer for question number 17. Speaking of freedoms or lack of freedoms, the next set of questions corresponds with the changes that took place in Iran after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Let's get into it. All right, so 18 and 19 correspond with this photograph titled, The Day 10,000 Iranian Women Protested the Headscarf, and this is published in March 1979. So when I see Iran, and I see 1979, I think Iranian Revolution, right? That's the time period where Shah Riza Pahlavi, the guy who was like the modern secular leader of Iran, is ousted after a student protest, and in comes Ayatollah Khomeini, who promised to basically basically turn the clock back in Iran, bring back more traditional Islamic principles, maybe you wanna call it Islamic fundamentalism. Okay, so part of that is, again, old school Islam means maybe more patriarchy and women should be covered in public. And these women were used to having rights and now those rights were being taken away from them. So they're protesting the fact that they have to wear a scarf over their heads. There are still protests in Iran today over the headscarf, so this is nothing new. It was new in 1979, but it's not new now. So take a look at question number 18. It says, the photo demonstrates a clash or a conflict between what? It's choice one, traditional cultural values, which is what the Ayatollah was bringing to Iran in 1979, and secularization. Secularization means making your society non-religious in terms of its governance, by separation of church and state. The previous leader, Shah Riza Pahlavi, was a secular leader, but the new guy is not. So the people want to be secular, but their traditional values are being pushed on them, right? So there's going to be a conflict. So choice one is our answer. This, this kind of represents an enduring issue, the tension between modern and traditional ideas. So something to keep in mind as well. 19, which event most directly contributed to the action shown in this photograph? So which one of these four things happened to lead to the photograph? Choice one says Iran's decision to become a member of OPEC. It's not the answer. OPEC is the organization of petroleum exporting countries, right? And Iran becoming a part of that would make them more powerful economically because they'll have more control over the oil supply. Oil and economics has nothing to do with headscarves. Cross off choice one. Passage of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This happens in 1948 after World War II. 
Okay, and that might motivate some people to protest in the name of rights, but there's a better answer. We'll get to it in a second. Founding of the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. The Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, this is a, a protest movement. It's still around today. Uh, basically, this happened in Argentina. Um, there was a government in power in Argentina that was repressing people's natural rights. Um, it was a very non-communist government, so the United States supported it, but it did some really sketchy things. It was basically kidnapping the children of people who were suspected to be communist or sympathetic towards communists. Okay, whereas this doesn't really have anything to do with communism. And since that happened in Argentina, it has nothing to do with Iran. So we're going to get rid of that. The best answer choice that applies here is four, right? Most directly. The Ayatollah's rise to power and his insistence on bringing back traditional Islam is what led to this protest movement most directly. So pick choice four for question number 19. All right, questions 20 and 21 correspond with the source called Global Summary of the HIV Epidemic in Women and Children, 2016. Okay, if you don't know, HIV is the virus that causes AIDS, right, which is a big problem because it, limited, it limits um, a person's life expectancy. Uh, so it, it's certainly a problem too because if people are dying young, that means there are less people involved in the workforce. And, uh, and if there are not a lot of people in the workforce, you're gonna have a bad economy, right? So this is a, a terrible situation for a lot of reasons. Loss of life, bad economy, it's not a good situation at all if this virus spreads really quickly. So take a look at the first like row here. Estimated number of women 15 plus living with this virus. 17 million, 17 plus million people globally, but 79% of those people are living in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, that means the vast majority of people living with HIV are living on the African continent. Okay, so there are some reasons for that that the question's gonna ask you about now. So let's take a look at uh, number 20 here. It says, what is a correct inference, meaning what can we conclude based on the data presented in the chart? Let's look at choice one. It says, global migration trends reveal people increasingly move to urban centers and living in overcrowded environments. Well, we're not gonna pick that one because this data here, this table does not show us anything about migration patterns. It shows us patterns of disease. So we're gonna cross off choice one. Skip two for now. Look at three. Post-independence movements led some African nations to experience conflict, genocide, and an increase in refugee populations. That is true, okay, but this is not what the chart is about. The chart is about people getting sick and dying of HIV, not because of conflicts. So we cross off choice three. Choice four says, modern societies continue to negatively impact the environment by polluting the air. The data is not about pollution, guys. Look at choice two. European imperialism has left many African nations with inadequate health care, a lack of education, and poverty. Why is that the answer? Because if people were properly educated about how to prevent this virus, it would not spread so much. Okay, so if you have a lot of poverty, you have bad schools or no schools at all, and you're not getting the proper education on how to avoid getting this sickness, and since we, we have a lot of people getting it, obviously the education is not where it needs to be. So choice two is the best answer for number 20. This chart would be most useful to a person or group advocating for, to advocate means to push for, right? You want something to happen. And it's going to be very simply, you want more health and education funding. If you have a school system, again, that, that will help teach people how to avoid getting this sickness. So someone could use this data to say, hey, we need better education. Choice four is the best answer here. Again, this has nothing to do with trade, climate, or countries getting together to stop conflicts. So choice four is the best answer for number 21. All right, questions 22 and 23 go with two documents here. All right, document A and document B, let's check them out together. Unlike the Cold War system, globalization, okay, if you don't know that word, globalization means the world is connected together through trade. Globalization has its own dominant culture, which is why it tends to be homogenizing. When you homogenize, you make everything the same. So what the author is saying so far is that globalization is causing everyone to have a similar culture. In previous eras, this sort of cultural homogenization happened on a regional scale. The Hellenization of the Near East and the Mediterranean world under the Greeks, the Turkification of Central Asia, North Africa, Europe, and the Middle East by the Ottomans, or the Russification of Eastern and Central Europe and parts of Eurasia under the Soviets. So these are regions of the world where people's culture was kind of homogenized, right? Maybe not on a global scale, but in each individual region, everyone's kind of the same. Culturally speaking, globalization, 
meaning the entire world connected together, is largely, though not entirely, the spread of Americanization from Big Macs to IMAX to Mickey Mouse on a global scale. Right? So the author is kind of saying the American economy and all of its trade around the world is leading to American culture going everywhere, influencing local cultures all over the place, right? McDonald's, you're going to see that all around the world. People using Apple products, yes, you're going to see that all around the world. Disney, a huge presence all around the world, right? Even Disney theme parks are global at this point. So I think there's probably some truth to Document A here. Don't forget, too, that globalization has been made possible by advances in types of technologies, whether they are like air travel or advanced shipping or things like the Internet, right? These are the things that link the world together. It might also be a good idea to know some strategic trade routes. The Indian Ocean is always a major trade route in world history. Uh, the Suez Canal, which runs through Egypt, is an important waterway uh, that connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. The Persian Gulf is another one that comes up on the regions a lot, and a lot of the world's oil supply runs through the Persian Gulf. So maybe have those in the back of your mind. Document B, let's take a look. It is a myth that globalization involves the imposition of Americanized uniformity. Right, so this author is saying that globalization does not necessarily mean that American culture is being forced on people. For a start, many archetypal American products are not as all-American as they seem. Levi Strauss, a German immigrant, invented jeans by combining denim with jeans, a style of trousers worn by Genoese sailors. So a German kind of clothing meshed up with a Genoese kind of clothing, right? Genoese, uh, Genoa is a city in Italy, right? So this is not really American. It's like a, a cultural hybrid, I guess you could say. So Levi's jeans are in fact an American twist on a European hybrid. Even quintessentially American exports are often tailored to local tastes. MTV in Asia promotes Thai pop stars. CNN in Espanol offers a Latin American take on the world. McDonald's sells beer in France, lamb in India, and chili in Mexico. Right, so these are examples of maybe of American businesses going around the world, but you don't see McDonald's forcing uh, people in India to eat a Big Mac, for example. That would be a big no-no, right? They're kind of tailoring what they serve to local interests. So it's not necessarily American culture being served in the McDonald's. What is the primary focus of these documents is what question number 22 is asking. Uh, so take a look at choice number one here. It says, the need for cultural exchanges in Europe, well, that's kind of already happening, right? So we don't, we're not advocating for it, it's already going on. The value of immigration to German regions, I don't see people migrating to Germany in these documents, right? There was a German immigrant to America, doesn't make any sense. So we're down to three and four, right? Always practice process of elimination if you can, right? The role of American culture in globalization, yeah, that's gonna be our answer here, right? They're debating how much American culture is actually being spread, but they're both talking about American culture going places at least to some extent, right? McDonald's here, McDonald's there, that's American culture spreading. The importance of the Cold War, documents have nothing to do with that. Cross off choice four, so we're left with three for 22. Question number 23 says, what claim about globalization is supported by these documents? So choice one says it minimizes trade. Definitely not. If anything, it maximizes trade, right? More places are connected together. It reshapes culture is going to be our answer, right? Because maybe you had a local culture, maybe you had a local restaurant, but now McDonald's is in the neighborhood, right? That's going to change your eating culture, I guess you could say, right? And McDonald's appears in both documents. It discourages creativity. I don't see any evidence for that. If anything, I see more creativity, right? Globalization leads to cultural diffusion and new clothing styles blending both French and Italian clothing styles. So I think that's pretty creative. So we cross off three. It restricts freedom. I don't think so, right? Freedom, man, you could, you could if you're, especially if you're American, right? You can get products from all around the world because of globalization. That's pretty free. So reshaping culture is the best answer for question number 23. All right, so question 24 corresponds with this source up here, so let's take a look at it. China is the world's leader in e-commerce. That's like websites that sell things and ship things around the world. So China's number one, apparently, in e-commerce, at least according to this source. With digital retail sales volume double that of the U.S. and accounting for a staggering 40% of the global total, according to digital business research company eMarketer. Last year, it also boasted four of the top 10 internet companies in the world, ranked by market capitalization. That means like how much the companies are worth on like a uh, stock market. 
according to the data website Statistica, or Statista, I apologize, including e-commerce giant Alibaba, social media and gaming company Tencent, and search specialist Beidou. Right, so there's no Google in China, in case you're wondering. After two decades of internet development under the Communist Party's firm leadership, he said, his country had struck the correct balance between freedom and order and between openness and autonomy. Right, so you have these websites that sell a lot of things and generate a lot of income, but you have a situation too in which the Communist Party uh, controls a lot of these websites and makes sure that they're watching what these businesses are doing. It is traveling, he said, on a path of cyber governance with Chinese characteristics. What China calls the golden shield is a giant mechanism of censorship and surveillance. If you're surveilled, that means the government is watching you. Censorship means the government is, uh, it kind of restricts your access to certain information, right? It doesn't let you see or hear certain things. So the, the, the system of censorship and surveillance blocks tens of thousands of websites deemed inimical to the Communist Party's narrative and control, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and even Instagram. So these places, these websites do not exist in China, right? Because those platforms provide people with uh, an opportunity to discuss things, right? Freedom of speech is part of those websites. No freedom of speech in China if you're gonna have censorship. So question 24, which conclusion about China can best be drawn from the passage? Well, it's not one. It uses a command economy based on Maoist principles. Yeah, maybe in the 1960s, but this is certainly a situation in which businesses are selling goods around the world and making money. That's capitalism. So we're gonna cross off choice one. It rejects capitalism? No, it's embracing capitalism, right? And it's certainly not welcoming democratic ideals. If it did, it would allow Facebook to exist. Crossed off choice two. Choice three, it wants to completely isolate itself? Definitely not, right? They're selling their goods all around the world. That's not isolation. So choice four is our answer. It wants the economic benefits of capitalism without free speech and democracy, right? They want to have websites that can sell things around the world to make money, but they don't want websites that, that allow people to interact with each other. So cross off one, two, and three. Choice four is your answer for question number 24. Okay, questions 25 and 26 go with the source up here. Let's take a look. My father was one of the million victims who were killed by the Khmer Rouge genocide. The Civil War in Cambodia happened largely at the same time as the war in Vietnam, and it's a situation in which communist forces are trying to overthrow non-communist forces, and Pol Pot led this group called the Khmer Rouge to try to bring communism into Cambodia. Once the Khmer Rouge succeeded in overthrowing the government in Cambodia, they committed some atrocities that are the subject of this document. Up to this today, I cannot comprehend the reason for the execution of my father and other millions of my fellow countrymen. My father was not a man of politics, nor was he a criminal by any means. As far as I can remember, he was a family man like any other Cambodian men in the country. He was a loving and caring father, a great protector and provider for his family and for those who worked in his shipping company. So it looks like he, he owned a shipping company. And in communism, right, there is no private property. So maybe that's why this guy was a target of the communist Khmer Rouge. He was a patriotic man. He did not abandon Cambodia during its civil war between 1970 and 1975 because he wished to devote his energy and resources for the reconstruction of the country after the war. Ultimately, his patriotism was not greeted with gratitude, but it was, it was received by punishment, then execution. Which claim is best supported by the evidence in the passage? Sisawath Dong Chanto questioned his father's patriotism. Well, that's not right, right? He just said he was patriotic. That's not questioning it. Choice two, the Khmer Rouge only arrested artists and authors. Can't pick that one, because this guy was neither an artist or an author. Right, he was a, uh, a guy who ran a shipping company. Cross off choice two. Choice four, many Cambodians resisted arrest by fleeing the country. I can't prove that to be true because this guy said he stayed in the country despite the problems, right? So this claim is not supported by the source. This is supported though. Millions of Cambodians were executed during the civil war, right? We see the executions right here with genocide, right? The genocide is the, the mass killing of a specific group with the intent, to, I guess, to cleanse them from the planet. So millions dead, choice three for 25.
26 is tough because you just have to know your historical figures. The actions described in the passage, meaning the Khmer Rouge genocide, is associated with which person? That's going to be Pol Pot. He's the leader of the Khmer Rouge. Ho Chi Minh was the leader of the North Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. Deng Xiaoping was the leader of China after Mao Zedong, who brought in some, uh, some capitalism. Uh, Sun Yat-sen is a person who began the Chinese nationalist movement just before World War I and right after World War I. So Pol Pot is our best answer for number 26, so pick choice two. Finally, questions 27 and 28 focus on child labor around the world. This is also an example of an enduring issue. Child labor has been around since day one of humanity, really ever since humans started to learn how to farm, and it really has not gone away in all parts of the world. Despite maybe the fact that first world countries have dealt with this effectively, you still see child labor popping up in some developing nations throughout the world. Okay, questions 27 and 28 go with the source called 80 Million Children Do Backbreaking Work, published in 2001. Let's read the source first. Deeply impoverished, okay, impoverished means poor, millions of children around the world sacrifice their health, safety, and sometimes their lives for just pennies a day. Child labor is cheap labor, says Darlene Adkins of the Child Labor Coalition. That also applied to like Britain during the Industrial Revolution, right? Child labor was cheap labor. Employers can pay children less than adults for the same work. In many cases, young workers labor for months, even years, without receiving a single cent. Ooh, that's pretty rough, right? Some kids are bonded laborers, says Robin Romano, a filmmaker who is shooting a movie about child labor around the world. Their families need to borrow money, so they sell their children into slavery to pay off their loans. A debt as small as $50 may put a family in bondage for a generation or more, right? Imagine like going into debt because you owe 50 bucks, right? That shows just how poor these people are. Most countries have laws that forbid businesses from hiring children to perform dangerous work. However, employers are rarely punished for breaking the law. Therefore, the biggest problem is enforcement, says Romano. You can write laws until you are blue in the face, but until countries have the political will and conviction to enforce them, the laws are meaningless. So according to the author, what is the underlying reason for the exploitation of child labor? If you don't know this word exploitation, that means like to take advantage of, right? The kids are being taken advantage of because their, their labor is cheap. Increasing health costs, no. Technological developments, no. Government intervention, no. Extreme poverty is clearly the answer to this particular question, right? If families weren't so poor, they would not send their kids to have to work. If they weren't so poor, they wouldn't sell their kids into slavery, right? Poverty is the reason for children having to take these jobs. That's, that's the case in countries around the world now that are developing countries. It was also the case in Great Britain during the Industrial Revolution. So choice two for 27. One more, 28. Which statement best describes the difference between child labor laws and enforcement as described in the, in the passage? Most countries have no laws to protect children. Can't pick that one because the document says most countries have those laws. So choice one cannot be the answer. Most employers are always punished for breaking laws. No, they're not punished, says it in the document. So I'm down to three and four. Unless people take action, little will change. I think we could prove that to be true because the laws are not being enforced, right? So unless we take some action in, in enforcing the laws, you're not going to get any changes. So choice three works. Choice four doesn't work. Child labor laws are changing to ensure children are earning equal pay for equal work. I can't prove that to be true using the source, right? If anything, we still have a problem of child labor and poor wages and lack of enforcement of the child labor laws. Choice four is not going to be correct. Three is our best answer. We have to enforce the laws, otherwise nothing is going to change. So that about does it for the multiple choice section of this exam. Stay tuned in the not too distant future when I review the CRQ section and the Enduring Issues essay. So make sure you're subscribed and look out for those videos when they do come out. Hope this video helped and good luck on your test. If you need additional review, check out these playlists that have additional review videos on multiple choice, the CRQ section, and the Enduring Issues essay.